persecuted within the university that or within the institution they took away his office and his his uh, uh his keys and his access to scientific samples wow. and and there was an even a, a disinformation campaign waged against him a congressional hearing that ended up uh uh, investigating his case, found that in the email trail there was where were people in the mu- museum were intentionally spreading false uh, rumors against him. He had no P- there were claims that he didn't have a PhD in biology. He has two earned PhDs, including one in evolutionary biology. Uh, that he was a priest. That he was working for the Bush campaign. All kinds of things. Um, and in the end, he was demoted. And uh, well, now he's working with us. And there are there are many such scientists who have found that. By questioning Darwinian theory and and even allowing and Sternberg wasn't advocating intelligent design at the time he was just he was just exploring he was just allowing an article to be published exploring the idea uh, many scientists have found that, that that they've come into this kind of opposition and so increasingly these scientists who have been dissenting from Darwinian orthodoxy are finding each other and it's created a, a kind of international network of uh, scientists from um, Many countries. Uh, one, there's a very prominent Brazilian uh, scientist, Marcos Eberlin, who's uh, on the editorial board for mm-hmm. the new journal Biocomplexity, and he's a member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. He's got 400 peer-reviewed publications, um, and he's a, a staunch advocate of intelligent design. So it's, this is a worldwide uh, scientific uh, research community, and it's growing, and it's, I think, a very exciting development in science because what it's it's creating is a genuine competition of ideas within biology about how we got here. And the way you framed it before was exactly right. Two possibilities. Either life is the result of an undirected, unguided, and strictly materialistic process, Mm -hmm. a mindless process, or a mind of some kind played a role. And we think that uh, it's the, we're advocating the latter view, and we think that the evidence supports that view. You know what I can't understand is is why, when scientists like like your your colleague who used to be at the Smithsonian comes up with um, a finding that may go against academia, why they they're persecuted? Isn't it the well? My understanding of science is that you go, you investigate. You report that what your findings are. So why should you he follow the evidence? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. You follow the evidence where it leads. That's that's what scientists uh, are are committed to doing in principle. Right. But of course, science are human beings. We all uh, have our our our, uh, our biases. And wh- one of the things about the origins issue that's maybe even unique among um, scientific controversies, and there are controversies in science, and and uh, and scientists mm-hmm. argue among themselves about how to interpret the evidence and. And when science is working well, those arguments proceed freely. But there are many cases where, where um, a minority view is marginalized or stigmatized, maybe unfairly, and then later vindicates itself. Uh, but this issue of biological origins, I think, is especially sensitive um, because of these larger philosophical issues that we were talking about earlier. Uh, I have a friendly debating partner who's a, a staunch Darwinist himself. His name is, is uh, Michael Ruse. Uh, he used to be at the University of Guelph in Canada, mm-hmm. and Roots has ri- written an important book in which he explains that uh, Darwinism, or the modern form of Darwinism called neo-Darwinism, has functioned as a kind of secular religion for many scientists. And many scientists are almost unaware of the way in which the Darwin's theory provides a kind of secular creation story for them. So when they, so when there is scientific evidence that's uh, brought against the theory and challenged to the theory, oftentimes scientific defenders of the theory react like anyone else would when their fundamental belief system is being challenged. And it makes the this debate a little bit more uh, tense and sometimes emotional than other scientific debates, uh, precisely because there's so much at stake philosophically. Well, you know, I, I can use an example that I've used many times before, Steve, is that we know for a fact Christopher Columbus did not discover the Americas, and yet historians refuse to to make any changes in in the educational system that says otherwise. Books are being printed today that are in schools today that Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas. So if it works that way in history, I you know I I never thought it would be like that in science though. Well, it might be a human nature thing. You know, we get wedded to one particular way of looking at things, and especially when there's a perception that there's a consensus. Whether there's a consensus or not, um, the perception of a consensus will often cause people to want to conform to what everybody else is thinking. Um, and and there's, there's always uh, 
a kind of social stigma in in proposing a radical new idea that that some you know in and diffi- it's difficult to stand firm when you think you've got good reasons for proposing a, a radical new idea but i think what's encouraging about this uh, the challenge that's being made to Darwinian th- mm-hmm. in contemporary times is that this is an idea that is 150 plus years old, and uh, even the modern version of Darwinism dates from the 1930s. And we have learned a lot about genetics and DNA and molecular biology and, and uh, developmental biology and and the fossil record in that period of time. And while Darwin's theory explains a number of things very well, in particular the small scale variations that we observe, like uh, the famous uh, peppered moth in England, where in which the uh, population went from uh, dark to light to dark color uh, over time, or the Galapagos finches in the in the uh, uh, in South America, where the beaks change shape and size in response to varying weather patterns. Um, those kinds of those kinds of um, variations, uh, and small scale evolution is well documented, and Darwin's theory, I think most scientists believe, explains that well. But where you have an increasing number of um, scientists expressing skepticism is uh, concerns the uh, the ability of natural selection and a mutation to generate the large scale innovations in the history of life when we see fundamentally new things arriving in the fo- in the fossil record so one evolutionary biologist has put it this way he says that uh, natural selection explains the survival but not the arrival mm. of the fittest the small stuff but not the big stuff very interesting tell me now this may sound far out to you but i'm going to ask you the question anyway is it possible that our origins actually come from the stars? There's a lot of people who believe that life here on this planet originated on another planet and was actually brought here by, by space travelers. Is that well, possible? This was for, yeah, um, well, I'm not, I'm not a proponent of that idea myself. Okay. I think it, it kind of pushes the, the question back one generation mm-hmm. and then leaves it unanswered all over again. But there have been some scientists who have proposed that. One... Um, uh, no less a figure than Francis Crick proposed that in a little book in 1980 called Life Itself. And wow. it wasn't clear whether he was doing this in jest or, um, well, more with tongue-in-cheek or whether he was really right. serious. Uh, but there was a reason that he proposed this, and that is that the, what's called the prebiotic environment the, uh, on planet Earth is actually mm-hmm. not was not, based on what we know from geochemistry, favorable to... Um, the formation of the, the the crucial molecules that life needs to 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 survive, and so he said, well, maybe maybe some other environment uh, in outer space is the the place where it happened. Steve, this is Steve, known as the theory of panspermia. Steve, stand by. We've got to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. This is a fascinating yeah. topic. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm really having a good time with this uh, topic. Exonation, uh, Steve yes, Mayer is our special guest. www.darwinsdoubt.com. The name of his book is Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. We'll be back on the other side of this news break. Don't go away. Are you considering calling a psychic to read your situation? Then consider David Champion a psychic medium for more than 20 years with thousands of readings under his belt. David Champion will make you feel comfortable. He has proven to be honest and accurate. He's a straight shooter. There's no guesswork. What he sees is what you get. While he is a medium, most of the calls focus on relationships, not only love, but work, school, neighbors, and more. Need help with finding a job and preparing for the interview? Are you dealing with people who are obstacles in your path? For more information, go to davidchampion.com, $1.50 per minute, paid by credit card, with a minimum of 30 minutes. For your reading with David Champion, call 1-877-702-8598. That's 1-877-702-8598. Now you can dial in to listen to the Exxon Radio Show from anywhere in the world with Rob McConnell 24-7, 365 by dialing 213-401-0080. That's 213-401-0080. If you have a mobile phone or landline, the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is now at your beck and call at 213-401-0080. That's 213-401-0080, 24-7. 
365. Now you can dial in to listen to the X Zone Radio Show from anywhere in the world with Rob McConnell 24 7 365 by dialing 213 401 0080. That's 213 401 0080. If you have a mobile phone or landline, the X Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell is now at your beck and call at 213 401 0080. That's 213 401 0080 24 7 365. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN TV. For more information on the X Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. And welcome back, everyone. Uh, Stephen Meyer is our special guest this hour. He's the author of Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. And his website is www.darwinsdoubt.net. Dot com. Uh, Steve, uh, you, you and I were talking during the commercial break in the news, and uh, we were just discussing the different, um, the different venues and the different um, people that have come on the show and their theories. And, I, you know, I, I, I've often talked about my friend Dr. Seth Shostak from SETI, and, and there are parallels between what SETI is doing and what you're doing. Well, right. The the argument that I'm making for intelligent design mm-hmm. is based on the importance of information to all biological systems. And the big discovery, really, that started in the 1950s, and a little background on this, that the, the, in the 1950s, Watson and Crick famously discovered the structure of the DNA molecule in 1953. But in 1957, Francis Crick, who was a code breaker in World War II, by the way, uh, put forward a, a, a hypothesis that is really a stop-press moment in the history of biology. It was called the sequence hypothesis. And what Crick realized was that there are four chemicals running along the interior spine of the DNA molecule, and the chemicals are called bases. And he proposed that these four chemicals are functioning like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters in a section of software or machine mm-hmm. code. That is to say, it's the precise arrangement of these chemicals, not their physical or chemical properties, that uh, allows the DNA to perform the function that it does. And what DNA, the function that DNA performs is that it provides instructions for building the protein and protein machines that cells need to stay alive. So you literally have digital code directing the construction of mechanical parts inside cells. Now, that means that, inf- that DNA is an information-bearing molecule. It's information-rich, and the information is stored in an alphabetic or, or, or digital form. Now, the people that are looking for extraterrestrial intelligence, the SETI um, so- scientists, mm-hmm. are actually looking for information embedded in a radio signal. And if they find a, a signal that isn't just a random noise or just a repeating uh, series of pulses, but something that has the, the, the signature of, of information, they will conclude that they have found evidence of intelligence in space. Information is a, a positive indicator of prior intelligent activity. And you may remember in the contact film that... Uh, with Jodie Foster, on, yeah. Yeah, with Jodie Foster, with, based on the Carl Sagan novel. Yeah. There's a point in the film where Jodie Foster realizes they're not just getting a you know, repetitive pulse or they're not getting random noise, they're getting a series of prime numbers. And that's an that's information-rich sequence. And they realize this, there must be an intelligence behind it. Now, that's science fiction. Mm-hmm. Nobody working on study has yet found uh, uh, the, the information-rich, sign- uh, information-rich structures that would uh, justify inferring that there, there was an intelligent source. But in biology, in every cell of every living organism, there is a molecule, DNA, that does have information embedded in it in, in, in just the way that we'd be looking for it in outer space. And so the, 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 the natural inference is that the information in, in DNA has an intelligent source. In fact, 
information always arises from intelligence sources. This is something that we know from our, our, our uniform and repeated experience.